Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Cami Fletcher, president of the Collective for Radical Death Studies. You have tuned in to one of our live programs that seeks to address the racial issues underlying COVID-19 and take a critical race lens to the current pandemic and crisis of 2020. This program entitled Police Brutality, Slave Past, and Digital Remembrance is the Collective for Radical Death Studies second Facebook event. Please go to our website, www.radicaldeathstudies.com for our first live event entitled Crisis Within a Crisis, Exploring Race, Ethnicity, and Nationality During a Pandemic. As you're watching, please feel free to leave comments and questions in the comment section under this video on Facebook. Please feel free to go to our social media pages, leave comments and questions with the hashtag CRDS Ask Dr. Ada. Now I'm turning it over to our facilitator, Kaylee Alexander and our most gracious guest, Dr. Renee Ada. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and thank you everybody for tuning in. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Renee Ader today. Um, she is Provost Visiting Associate Professor in Africana Studies at Brown University and Associate Professor Emerita at the University of Maryland. She holds a BA from Oberlin College and an MA and PhD in Art History from the University of Maryland. A public scholar who works at the intersection of art and history, Dr. Ader's research focuses on monuments, race, national identity, and public space. She is the author of Keith Morrison, Volume 5 of the David C. Driscoll series of African American art, and Remaking Race and History, the sculpture of Meta Warwick Fuller with the University of California Press. She has written on a wide range of public monuments, including the Unsung Founders Memorial at the University of North Carolina, the African American Civil War Memorial in Washington, D.C., the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site in Alabama, and the Crispus Attucks Memorial in Boston. Cur currently, Dr. Ader is engaged in an open source digital project entitled Contemporary Monuments to the Slave Past, Race, Memorialization, Public Space, and Civic Engagement, which has been funded through the National Endowment for the Humanities, Mellon Foundation, the Getty Research Institute, and the Smithsonian Office of Fellowships. We're very excited to have Dr. Ader here today to talk about her Remembrance Project entitled I Can't Breathe, a Digital Memorial, for which shortly after the murder of George Floyd, she pledged to post the names of unarmed black and brown people murdered by the police for 120 days. So uh, Dr. Ader, um, could you begin just by giving us a little introduction to your memorial and talking about the motivations for starting this project? Sure. So Kaylee and the Collective for Radical Death Studies, thank you for this invitation to talk about this Instagram memorial that I created at the end of May and posted um, on the first slide or memorial marker on June 1st of this year. So the project uh, really came about from my own grief at witnessing the murder of George Floyd on May 25th. Um, I felt as traumatized as I assume many others in the United States have felt at seeing that moment um, of complete disregard for a human life. Um, watching a white police officer with indifference kneel and kneel and kneel for eight minutes and 46 seconds uh, just tore something inside me. I felt that my heart was sore um, at witnessing this. And I in all honesty, could not completely process what I was seeing uh, in those video clips that were on the news. Um, so the project stems from my own personal grief at witnessing this man's death. It's also very much tied to COVID-19 and to the death of my advisor, mentor, uh, Professor David Driscoll on April 1st of uh, 2020 from COVID-related pneumonia. And so, George Floyd's death and David's death have become conflated to a certain degree uh, in the project. And it's, it's also um, about watching uh, on a completely personal of watching my brother-in-law die last year uh, in hospice and what we think a good death should look like and how hard death can be. 
So these three things are coming together. I think that I've been in grief for a year and didn't realize it until the George uh, Floyd's death happened on uh, on national television um, through the release of that young woman's uh, cell phone video. It's also uh, really tied. So I have, you know, this uh, the death of a brother-in-law in July of uh, 2019 and uh, hospice and what I call an unromantic death. Um, we have the death of David Driscoll, a man who I was very, very close to. Um, we have the murder of George Floyd. And then we also have uh, two other things that are happening uh, for me at this moment. On the day that George Floyd is murdered, Amy Cooper in New York City does this heinous act of calling the police on the bird watcher in the park. So, and I then became filled with rage. So I have both grief and rage kind of flowing through me at the same time. So there is this horror at seeing the deliberate death of another human being. There's a horror at watching a white woman using race politics to put a black man at risk. And then it's Memorial Day, actually, when this all happens. And in my family, uh, with my husband's family, we have a practice of, and he, something that is very new to me, but a practice of going to the cemetery every single Memorial Day. And we have visited three Memorial Day, three cemeteries uh, on that Memorial Day um, in the DC area. And so this uh, notion of memorial practice is part of my life um, in that sense of going to cemeteries often uh, for personal reasons, but it is also the work that I do. So there's two. So the, another thing happened is, uh, is the New York Times did their memorial right on the front pages of the paper. And I found David's name uh, in the process of scrolling through the New York Times uh, on my phone uh, through the New York Times app. And so I was looking at the 100,000 names of COVID dead. And I landed by real happenstance on David Driscoll's name and felt this real flow of um, grief, like renewed grief or unresolved grief, I guess is what I would call it. Um, and I, at that point of going through the New York Times Memorial, I was considering writing something on my blog about like, what does it mean to use a, uh, the ephemeral quality of a newspaper mm-hmm. as a tombstone, which is in effect what I right. thought that they were doing. So what did that, what did that mean? And then when I started uh, feeling this grief, complete loss at the death of a man I did not know, and this is part of the interesting process of this, um, but to watch uh, George Floyd die on television, I began to think, how, how can I talk about this? So one of the things, the first things I did was I wrote a blog post that I posted on May 29th on my website. And on this blog post, I had gone through a lot of different lists. I had looked at Say Her Name. I had looked at the Washington Post um, compilations of of, of folks killed by the police. I had gone to Black Lives Matter. I had looked at Wikipedia. So I started to compile a list. And I was, quite frankly, appalled at how long it was and how many of the names I did not remember. Um, And so that idea of... of disremembering was really shocking to me Um, because these are are, are stories that we see in the news every single year for 30 years, at least in my lifetime um, that I've been aware of, particularly starting in my twenties. So I, um, that idea of, of coming and I, and my work is really about, I have been spending the last two years thinking a lot about death. And, and black cemeteries and public monuments uh, to African-Americans. So I have been spending a lot of time wandering through cemeteries for about two years. Um, so I thought, why not translate my blog to the memorial, to Instagram? Mm-hmm. And I wanted to do it really simply. And it's not that I wanted to simple for myself, but I wanted a way that I could be reflective without a lot of bells and whistles. So I came up with the idea of a really simple memorial marker with the black uh, uh, picture with white type. Um, And then I started thinking I would post just George Floyd's name. Like I thought, let me do a little interruption into Instagram, which at that point still felt very much about people's barbecues and, you know, COVID being at home and pictures of children, you know, of my friends, my network. 
Um, and I wanted to disrupt that kind of rosy rosiness of Instagram. I do not want to imply that Instagram is only used for kind of um, in that way, because I think people use it. it. It's an incredible politically, socially engaged tool. But in my network, there's a, there was a lot of posting that seemed to me superficial. Um, mm-hmm. And so I thought to create these memorial markers and I posted one. And then I had mostly a response from my graduate students, actually former graduate students. And I started to have conversations with my friends and family, realizing that this grief is something that many of us are feeling and have no outlet for this grief. So if you're not in the street protesting, which is different from grief, actually, um, then what do you do with what you're feeling inside? How do you wrestle with this notion of grief in a public way? So once I posted that first slide, which are out of order now on Instagram, but there was an order, there was an order, <laughs> it started with George Floyd side slide. Um, and then I, my list is in chronological order with the most okay. recent death going back in time, which may okay. seem crazy to people, but that's how it works. Um, and I started to post a slide every day um, as a way of the importance of calling someone's name. Yeah. Uh, remembering that they had lives, remembering they had families, they had mothers, they had fathers, um, they had children and grandmothers and aunties and uncles who loved them. And what we get through the press is the black criminal or they deserve to be shot, but, 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 and, and there is no, but, but there Mm -hmm. is the simple loss of life uh, at the hands of the police and with extreme force Uh, in most cases I was looking at. So I then started to post every day, uh, trying to in fact use the Instagram slide as a way of um, each day recognizing that I was grieving and not pushing it away and saying, well, that is where I am now and that's where I'm gonna be for a while is in this state of grief. Yeah, I think that's fascinating and it's become sort of a practice for you. Um, But I also noticed that when you went back and sort of edited the the Instagram feed, you posted a title slide um, and a series of instructions for interacting. It's maybe you could sort of also walk us through uh, how you expect other people to interact with this when they're scrolling through their feeds and come across one of these black squares. So I think um, with the Instagram instructions, what I realized is I had posted for a week and then I realized that I one of my colleagues emailed me and said, well, how come you don't have birth dates for everybody? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm having a hard time finding birth dates for everybody. Like this was a, um, a difficult thing. So then I thought, well, let me go back. And I had two really wonderful former graduate students who I had worked with, Cecilia Wickman and Mary Savick, who helped me go back and go through the social security death records and actually find birth dates for everyone as, as much as possible. And then I thought it might be useful for folks who landed on the on one of these slides, if they go back and look at that original slide, to get a sense of what the project was about. Um, and so I named it "I Can't Breathe: A Digital Memorial" simply because of that. Those words leaving over and over again George Floyd's mouth, but actually that many other brown and black people have said those same words. So the first slide is just a title slide that tells us what is going on um, with the project. Um, And then I um, wanted to give people kind of instructions, if that makes sense. Um, So I have a slide that says, you know, I started this um, and I thought that it would be 90 days, but the list kept growing. Quite frankly, once I landed on the Save, uh, Save Their Name website, I realized that women were really not part of this conversation of police brutality in general. And I wanted to put their names on this list as well. So I started to add women's names to the list. Um, Breonna Taylor is right in the middle of all of this happening. Um, The second slide, the third slide is ask that if you land on one of these memorial markers, that you simply take a minute to acknowledge the life lost to police brutality. It is a simple act, but it keeps these ideas of what Black Lives Matter is about, why these protests are happening in our streets. It kind of keeps that in the foreground uh, for you throughout the day. And it also is a way of humanizing what is a pretty stark memorial uh, marker in black and white. 
Um, I ask that you breathe in and out because I think all of us inhaled that day at watching the death of George Floyd. I actually think that I could not, and this is going to sound like a strange, strange thing to say. I'm not equating my experience to, to anybody who's been killed by the police, but I found I had a knot in my stomach, in my heart, in my lungs that I could not actually fully take a breath for many, many weeks after his death. Um, and so this act of breathing in and out is asking you to both think about the luxury that we have of breathing in and out, but also a reminder to myself to breathe in and out because I had, had, had kind of seized up in turn inside actually I'm um, at this moment. I ask that you say their name. I think it's really important that we say these names over and over again. And if we have to say them every day for the next 20 years, then we have to say them every day until change happens. But that calling a name makes someone real. You cannot just call them a black criminal. You can't just say, well, he was a druggie. He was mentally ill. He was homeless. Those are no reasons to kill anybody. So saying their name is to actually re-anchor them uh, in our world. So that was part of why I asked um, folks to do that. And then I did um, want to move beyond the story of trauma and of the horrible deaths. Um, and I asked then for if, if you decided that you wanted to participate in this memorial, a daily memorial on Instagram, that you learned something about them as a human being um, and not just that last brutal act that we are protesting. But, um, and I was struck by someone saying, um, you know, he loved, he planted roses in his mother's front yard. Like that's a very human act. Yeah. He liked to joke. He taught his granddaughter how to ride a bicycle. She made the best, you know, lemon pound cake, whatever it is, these very human things about us, uh, that there's human things about these men, women, and children who were also killed. It's to, in some ways, what this memorial through this personal act is trying to humanize uh, the list, so to speak. I then, um, this slide is kind of interesting. I said, then act, take responsibility, um, and what I really mean that by that is take responsibility for your privilege. Um, and what is it that you can do, whether it's on a micro scale uh, or on something much grander, but what can you do? Can you reach out your hand? Can you educate? Can you donate money, resources? Um, go out and protest, demonstrate, ensure that we have the right to vote, that we um, see something different. So that is the last instruction. And then I wanted to just thank people for joining uh, the Remembrance Project. So that's what those slides are about. The slides got a little out of order from uh, my original list on Instagram. Uh, excuse me, my little original list on my blog post, partly because I made these edits. Right. Um, so if you were to go back and actually look at the list, kind of do a comparison, they originally streamed in parallel to um, the blog post. On that note, it, let's take a, maybe a moment of silence to sort of slowly scroll through the memorial and let all of our viewers kind of take in um, the work that you've done compiling these names.
now we can maybe close out the memorial and go back to just sort of talking about Instagram as a as a medium for yeah. presenting the memorial. Because one of the first thoughts that came to my mind when I saw this project was that Instagram itself was a really interesting platform to display this thing. Um, on the one hand, it's got this very permanent quality because it's always going to be on the internet in some way or another. But on the other hand, you know, as you're scrolling through, you're, you're passing names and they're kind of fading into the distance. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you what you think the effect of using this particular digital platform is on how the memorial and the memory of these people uh, is perceived and consumed by, by others. So that's a, a great question. Um, and I was particularly struck by your notion that um, nothing ever goes away <laughs> on the internet, actually. Um, I intended it to disrupt your day, to be honest, that both to disrupt your day, but also to allow space for those who want it. I mean, there's people I'm sure who just click right by it and it, it's just there and they're, that they're not interested. But for those who have expressed interest to me, and I have a list of people I kind of communicate about the project um, when I kind of get it together to communicate to, with them. But I, I, this disruption is that when you come upon a name and you, sc you, you scroll through, let's say, your political content and maybe you're stro scrolling through your family content and your friends are, you know, having cocktails at the beach, but my slide might interrupt that. And, and force just, even if it's a, one second acknowledgement that someone died and it didn't die on that day, but that this death happened and that to acknowledge black death is really important to me. Uh, and I can talk about this in a little bit as it relates to my own research. Mm -hmm. um, and I have been really surprised at how particularly black cemeteries are, we're losing them and they're being destroyed and they're being developed. So that this would disrupt you, that you would pause. Um, I've gotten really interesting feedback from a variety of kinds of people who are interacting and they're not all academics who are following me on there. There are friends who I've known for years and years. Um, for one friend, and it was really poignant, she emailed me almost immediately to say, I have lost my complete faith. She's a Christian. And this memorial is just letting me figure out how to get back there. And I thought that was fascinating. Like, that's not what I intended that that would be. But I also lost faith. So I know what she's talking about. Everything that you believe in is put on kind of hold in the wake of such violence. Um, and I know others who uh, go out in the morning and they take a stroll out into a field and they have a kind of a ritual experience in that way, you know, listening to nature, but having the name in uh, one person ex expressed how she would go into this field and she says the name and she kind of lets it go. She releases it back to the natural world. And I thought that was quite beautiful um, effort. I know the issue uh, with several of the markers, if you read the, the, if you do a little research, I mean, the other thing is I want people to actually find out who they are. I actually right. do want you to pause. I want you to take a moment and go look up that one name and take you know, the time it takes you to drink a latte to <laughs> actually look that person up and think about them um, and to give their life some shape and form uh, for yourself. Um, so I chose Instagram. It's really interesting. I, I And I will be real honest with you, Kaylee. I'm not a super social media person. I have been really frustrated by social media. It's why I got off of Facebook. Um, and I, I deleted my Facebook account about, gosh, eight months ago. Um, and I wanted to figure out how to use Instagram in a way that worked for me. And so that's part of what this, so in some ways I'm taking something that's intensely private for me, this grief that I am unreconciled to and how do I deal with it? And then how do I also do this kind of very private memorial process, but also offer it up to others who also, in my mind, at least from what people told me, also need some way of grieving. Um, but Instagram is a strange place to be doing this. Um, I'm not the only one who's posting memorial kind of plaques or there's lots of images now circulating um, around, say her name. Um, and artists now are engaging. I've actually had some interesting conversations with a few artists around this. I, this is someone, in fact, I had a graduate student, a former graduate student say, is this an art project? No, it's not. 
I'm mm-hmm. not in the way that I, it's, it's one a w- form of expression for me, right? There's all mm-hmm. sorts of ways that I'm trying to express what I do. Um, the blog is one way, an academic article is another way, talking to you is one, another way, doing this memorial is another way of, of just expressions of, of what I'm thinking about um, in this t- difficult times we live in. So that's kind of how I came to Instagram is really trying to um, get into the stream of that stream of, uh, and, and makes you want to pause if you're willing to. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting too, that you bring up this, this issue of, of private versus public space as well, because you originally had your Instagram on private and you sort of had the ability to control access to mm-hmm. who used this. And now you've opened it up. Um, and you've, you said you've uh, chosen to disable comments as well. Um, So what do you think the effect of sort of opening this memorial up to everybody is and and why are you disabling comments? Okay, so two things there. So (laughs) so I opened it up because I was uh, uh, getting a lot of requests from from people to join because they had been recommended by somebody else who was already looking at it, right? Right. So to just manage that, uh, quite frankly, I'm trying to write a project and I just (laughs) couldn't manage all of that. It's really time, right, to, to... so it happened on private because my, my Instagram has always been on private setting. I've never had a public Instagram feed ever. So I decided to disable that if I disabled comment, commenting, that way I could open it up. And I disabled commenting because, um, and this is very specific. I had a nasty encounter actually on Twitter with Ivanka Trump, where, uh, where basically I've been blocked from posting anything on her site. So what I did was take some of the markers and she was talking uh, just nonsense, actually, about this. And I post, started posting them on her on her Twitter feed. Um, as a little disruption, like you don't get to create an alternative narrative to what is really happening. Right. When we say Black Lives Matter, it is really about the effects of white supremacy. Mm-hmm. And it is about the level of violence inflicted on Black lives and brown lives. And this is something that needs to be attended to. And to deny it is absolutely actually insane. Yeah. Um, and so I, what I woke up at three, I have insomnia. I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and I just, I, I don't even know how I landed on her Twitter feed, but I saw this. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense, this denial. And so I posted and they were there for about eight hours before they were removed. So I started to think about who gets to comment, who gets right. to say what, and I'm not really interested in having to deal with white supremacists on this website. I don't want to justify what I have to, what I'm doing to them. Um, and I, one of the reasons I've been so wary in particular of Twitter is just the free for all nastiness, the sexism, the racism, the homophobia. It's just, I've been shocked on Twitter, like what people yeah. have the right to say. So that's why I disabled the comedy. But I also noticed that I didn't need um, I also posted something, you know, in the in a note I sent to people. You don't have to. I don't I have no idea how many people are following this. I know I got notes back. I said you don't have to like it. You don't have to write. So you can still like it because you can't really disable that. So there's kind of a core group who always do that, and I know who they are, and there are people I know very well. But there was one woman who wrote and said, "I really hope that it's okay. I want to follow you, but I don't want to have to put a like or love sign out." And right. I said, "That's." It completely, you choose to interact in it in the way that it suits you. Um, so, so I also didn't want to have to police comments as well. See monuments. Yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> people always have something to say. So Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, the slave past and I, I wanted you to, to speak a little bit about that and introduce that project as well um, because I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of the work that you've done on those monuments has sort of informed the way that you think about memorializing as well so um, if, if you could talk about that that would be great. So the contemporary monuments to slave past is um, management uh, system, which is what Omeka is, but it exists as an Omeka site. And right now, what it is, really, what I'm really doing right now is building an archive um, as a way of documenting uh, communities' engagement with slavery um, and how are people going about the memorialization process. So that is 
what that larger project is doing. But I have been thinking about monuments for a decade uh, with this project. So it's a long-term project that I've been thinking at, you know, little pieces here and there. But one of the things that is um, really interesting is about two years ago when I was a Getty Fellow, um, I was working on the Contraband and Freedmen um, Cemetery Memorial in Alexandria, Virginia. And I spent a lot of time in that cemetery. Um, it's both a private place of reflection for those who have deceased uh, family members in that society, but it is actually an open archaeological site. It is a public space. So walking through that space, I was really interested that there was a record book called Gladwin's Record um, that lists actually everybody buried in that site. Um, it is a desecrated cemetery uh, in the sense that people you know, light industry moved into that area. It was lost by the end of the of the uh, 19th century. They were excavating dirt out of it. The freeway started to encroach on it. There was all sorts of things that kind of shocked me, actually, about the dinner, the desecration of Black life in death. Like, I was just, I couldn't figure out, like, what is going on here? Um, and I actually read Thomas LaCour's uh, book, um, uh, thinking about the work of the dead, a cultural history of mortal remains. And when I was reading this book, I kept saying, where are black lives? Like we have to be more than a paragraph or two yeah. in this book. That's probably that thick, right? That's a thick volume. But he, and I want to read this quote because it was really important to me to thinking about this and it relates to the, the memorial. He wrote to treat the dead body as if it were ordinary organic matter to leave it lie as if it were um, the body of a beast or willfully to desecrate and mutilate it is to erase it from culture and from humanity, to deny the existence of the community from which it came, to deny its humanity. And I started to really think about like, why are we denying the humanity of African-Americans in death? Um, and there were a series of articles that were written in the Atlantic and the New York Times and the Washington Post from about 2015 to 2017. And they framed it as Black Death Matters. And I was intrigued at that connection to Black Lives Matter. Um, and and a contested, uh, and it still continues to be um, a contested uh, church here in Washington, DC. Um, there was a cemetery up in Bethesda um, that was about to be, um, well, is actually, they're building a storage facility on it. And there is a, someone held up a sign that said, Black Ancestors Matter. And I thought, and this is the right about the time that we're seeing all of this activity around Black Lives Matter in our area, in Baltimore, and in this, in, in DC, and so forth. So um, I was really interested in, like, the power of naming an individual, of retrieving them from history, of resituating them in the past is important. Um, and you don't have the exact same kind of desecration that, of, of white cemeteries that we see with African-American cemeteries. We just don't. Yeah. Um, I was also reading Beloved by Toni Morrison, and I had returned to it as a novel. And I was interested in her ideas of remembering and disremembrance and yeah. kind of the play, right, the tension between those two. But she ends the novel with this really poignant call for naming and that the reason Beloved is not known is that because she ha her name hasn't been called, right? right? Um, that she's disremembered and unaccounted for. So I have kind of Thomas LaCour ideas circulating around. I'm thinking about Toni Morrison's um, Beloved. And these all fit into my larger project, right? I mean, my project is about the slave past and death is part of that past. Um, I also um, was at, so at the cemetery in Virginia, they've named on these bronze plaques, everyone's name is listed. And I find that a very effective kind of haptic encounter. Family members go up, they touch their names, they, they trace them on paper, very much like Maya Lin's uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Um, I then, you know, went to the National Memorial for Peace and Justice uh, in Montgomery, Alabama to the opening weekend in April of 2018. And seeing those bodily, their, their core team steel rectangles hanging from the ceiling, but they have, they're embodied, they are bodily reminders of lynching. And, um, and 
obviously e, uh, EJI, the Equal Justice Initiatives, aims are really to talk about mass incarceration and police brutality. Like that's their mission. Right. Um, and so that idea of the naming again, of retrieving, it, it's, you know, the work that Walter uh, White did, you know, in the 20s and 30s and recording lynching names. Um, this project can, you know, harken all the way back, this memorial right. project I'm doing harkens all the way back to that lynching project, quite frankly. I'm not putting myself in the same uh, amazing territory as Mr. White, but that idea of listing names so that they cannot be forgotten uh, is really key. And then I, um, so October of last year, I went to a lot of cemeteries. And I was, for the most part, horrified at the African-American sections at what disrepair they were. So in Schenectady, I went to the Historic Vale uh, Cemetery that has the African-American burial grounds. And someone had actually knocked over the headstones. And there were beer cans everywhere. And someone had left their beer cans and removed the headstones from their bases so they were flopped over. And I was... I, you know, I was heart sore that someone thought that in death they were still going to deny someone's humanity by knocking over those head uh, those headstones. So I actually wrote to the historic. I wrote to everybody in Schenectady, uh, tried to get someone to actually pay attention uh, to this. Um, and I was also um, at the Whitney Plantation this this past February, um, where they have named all on these black granite uh, inset slabs all the names that they have recovered of black women, men, and children who worked on those plantations are listed there. And that was also an astonishing like thing to see, to walk yeah. into that plantation, which is the Whitney plantation is an interesting space because it really is a memorial. Um, it is memorializing um, the loss of enslaved persons' lives. I mean, that's what it feels. It's very different than some of those other plantations down in Louisiana. So I was, so I've been thinking about cemeteries. I've been to Frederick Douglass's cemetery at Mount Hope in Rochester. I've been to uh, Harriet Tubman's uh, grave at um, Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn. And each of those encounters, particularly with both Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, really moved me deeply to be in those spaces. So I, I want to honor, uh, quite frankly, the you know, women, men, and children who have been killed by the police. That's partly what this memorial is. I wanted to do that honoring. Um, so it it's so uh, what I realized when I was thinking about talking to you today is how enmeshed the I Can't Breathe Memorial is with my um, Contemporary Slave uh, Monuments to Slave Pass project. And I have completely... Uh, uh, shifted my understanding of that project and what it can do and will probably uh, and what I'm working on now is to separate the Omega site into kind of an archival site and I will do some mapping uh, work out of that but then to write something that is melds both this memorial project and uh, kind of an interest in these monuments to slavery into one what I hope will be an innovative digital project uh, that, down that's fascinating the yeah especially you know the act of naming is is for memorials to all sorts of different traumatic events. You think about all, you know, genocides and the Holocaust and you think about naming. And this felt very much for me right in line with that um, mm -hmm. practice as well. Um, and I love that you talk about the, the stumbling upon these monuments. And I think that that's also very similar to, you know, you stumble upon these, these graveyards that have been desecrated mm -hmm. as well. And you realize, oh, people are buried here. They're, this is about people and it's been forgotten. And, and I really liked that aspect of the, the Instagram memorial as well. Um, yeah. You know, Kaylee, it's interesting because the, that worse a stumbling because I actually yeah. have been thinking of the Stoppelsteins, the stumbling stones mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. in Germany, but also there's a project here that's using them. Um, and so I was also, that's something I've also been thinking about. Like, what does it mean to encounter something that you don't expect to count or walking across the street or standing in front of a home or that's in the ground that yeah. pop that would cause you to kind of stop for a moment. So those ideas um, are definitely tied to that tradition of that stumbling stone that they use in memorial in Germany to memorialize the Holocaust. Right. So there's a connection, strange connection there as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it completely interrupts your day and sure people can say that maybe the landscape of social media has, has slightly changed in light of recent events and people yes. are posting different things, but even so it's, it 
something about that black square just completely interrupts the entire feed um, and, and does make you pause whether you want to or not. Um, and I wanted that black, that black screen to interrupt you, that image to interrupt, um, because I have been in so many cemeteries and I have seen so many uh, war cemeteries, you know, with the white stone, with the black writing. And I wanted something that's counter to that yeah. of war dead, right? Like it functions quite differently from that. But I was thinking about that. And I very deliberately uh, also thought that, that because there is such a rich tradition of what I would say use of color actual Mm -hmm. hue on Instagram that this would stand out in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you've touched a little bit on this already, but uh, about how this has been sort of ritualized for you and a way for you to, to process your grief over the current situation. And I noted that on your, your blog, you sort of started that post with I'm angry, I'm anguished, I'm heartbroken, I'm hallowed out. And I was wondering if you can maybe speak a little bit about how, how you, how have you been processing this? Has has this truly been a therapeutic memorial for you? And and do you think it is serving that for others as well? Well, I can say for, I can speak, you might have to speak to other people who are engaging. Okay. For me, it has been therapeutic. The first two weeks I had selected without, this is how, you know, unconscious thought works. I selected like an eight minute meditation and I'm not sure why I selected eight minutes and I would sit down every, so I'll tell you how this works for me in general. So I make a slide every single morning. I don't make them in advance. I sit down and I make them in Photoshop and it's a very, it opens Photoshop and I have my blank screen and I put on the name. Um, I then upload it right to Instagram. Um, But all the while, while I'm, I go back to my, to my blog post, I look at the name and then I start to read the articles that I've highlighted there. And I might actually read more material. So my morning is pretty occupied with this, actually, when I first get up. I'm reading about the person uh, who's highlighted during that day. Um, I make the slide. Um, depending on how much insomnia I've had the night before, <laughs> they, normally I'm kind of between 8.30 and 9. It gets posted sometimes, you know, it's not till 10.30, which means I've had a bad night. Um, so, but there's, a, there's that, for me, it's a very ritualized as I need it to be. Um, so I post the slide and then I do a a small meditation where I write on, I have some stationery that my sister gave me and that's cardstock and I cut the into strips and I write, I then do a whole nother thing of writing the name on this cardstock and I have an altar that I set it on and I sit and meditate anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes every day. In the beginning, it was almost impossible for me to sit through without sobbing. I just, it was the uh, intense, and this is very private, but an intensely emotional experience to do this as a grieving process. Um, But I kept at it because I thought I need to find a way to not only grieve, but actually to have faith that, um, that my actions, that my deep commitment to meditation and to mindful practice actually has meaning because at that point it felt like why practice mindfulness if this is the violence we face like I can practice having an open heart every single day but if it can't reach out and do anything then what's the point of doing all this like I was really in crisis around this so I um and then after I meditate, I light a candle. It's a, it's, it is a very ritualized product. I don't expect everybody else to do this ritualized experience, but mine is a very ritualized uh, action. And then I actually have a Buddhist prayer wheel that I bought from an artist uh, in Seattle who lives in Birmingham, Washington, actually. And I bought it in Seattle. And it's a, I've had it for about a decade. And I normally just put little well wishes or prayers in there for other people. I emptied it completely. So those are all sitting to another, in another box somewhere. Emptied it out. And then... Normally what happens is I keep the names on the altar for a week. So once a week, I take all the names, I stick them in the, in the prayer well, and I turn it three times and I say a prayer. What I've noticed is this very ritualized context of thinking about this every day, and particularly on Sundays when I put them in the wheel, I do think it's therapeutic that I'm being able to kind of move forward. I was paralyzed. I think like many of us were, I don't think I'm the only person who was paralyzed by witnessing this. Um, this has allowed me to move forward. About three weeks into the process, a really good friend of mine said, Renee, you have got to check out this this, this uh, thing on Instagram, but also on WordPress called um, the NAP Ministry. And it is a 
woman artist who is dedicated to the real, it was founded in 2016 by Trisha Hersey, Hershey. And it's about our grind culture, but also more importantly, it's about rest as restorative, that we have the right to rest. And she thought, my friend thought, Renee, you need to rest a little bit around this and you need to take that space and you don't have to work like a maniac. I mean, technically I'm retired, but I still feel like I'm working, you know, full time. And so with this, I was able to, those messages. And so I actually subscribed to the Nat Ministries feed on Instagram so that I could start to follow them and think about like, what does rest really mean? And then I went to the WordPress site and they have this amazing, um, blog post that's called rest supports grieving grief rituals um from april 8th of 2020 and they really deeply talk about like the grieving process is a slow process and we're allowed to feel grief and one way that grief if we rest it helps us kind of therapeutically move forward and so i kind of wholesale bought their message i just <laughs> what a, the nap ministry's idea of rest just resonated really deep with me um, and they also talked about a grief jar. And I thought, oh, that's what my, that's what you're doing. That's what I'm doing is I have a grief jar, which is a prayer. It's a ceramic prayer wheel that I turn. And it's about this tall. It's a very tall object. Um, but that's what I have as a grief jar. And so that action is really helping me move forward. Um, and also listening to some pretty radical um, black mindful trainers and mindfulness um, kind of folks who are dedicated to the mindful message has also helped who are trying to wrestle with the pain we feel the anger we feel with also the love that we need to express like how do we do those two things um, at the same time which is very hard actually to be grieving and angry and also wanting to somehow find that there is the capacity for love still in one's heart. So I've just been working through that. To be honest, this is what this has done for me. I mean, I think one thing that I've really acknowledged when I also realized that I was still grieving the death of my brother-in-law and of David Driscoll is that grieving takes as long as grieving takes. We tend to want to be very confined and center and say, well, you have to be done or feel better or get over it or... And that's just not true. So whether or not after 120 days, I will feel over this, I'm not sure I will, but this is helping me process it. Yeah. And, and at this point, have you, do you have 120 names or are there, is the list growing? The list is growing. So this is an interesting question that someone asked me recently. They're like, are you going to keep going? And someone said, did you, did you time this to be timed with the election? No, mm -hmm. I timed it because there were names that kept growing. And I have added to, I think, the top of the list as um, on June 30th, about eight more names that have come out um, that are being investigated by either the Department of Justice or by local police uh, officers, at, uh, local police departments um, as signs of that these weren't just kind of people resisting arrest, but were in fact murders that we've, that, that were experienced. So um, it is, there are some days I don't, I have stopped watching the news because I cannot handle the constant chatter uh, on the news and the swinging back and forth between, between the conversation kind of about COVID and Black Lives Matter. I see the two as intimately linked. Um, and I think Black Lives Matter would say that these things are intimately linked as well. Um, and so in the idea that we have not been able to practice our normal morning practices during COVID. You know, if you, so if a family member died, for example, there's been no memorial service, formal memorial service for David Driscoll. Okay. Um, and so that leaves you hanging. Like, how do we express also grief? So this becomes a way of expressing that grief because I can't go to a cemetery. I can't go to a headstone. I can't go to a service. Um, and so this functions like that for me. That's great. Um, well, we're running a little bit uh, to the end of our time, but yeah. Um, is there anything else in, in the last few minutes that you just wanted to add about this project or, or what you're currently working on? You know, one of the things that um, is that what I would like to say is that activism comes in all shapes and sizes. And we have this notion, and I think some of us think that if we are not in the streets, that we can't affect change. Um, I think for me, it's been a process of actually being quiet to figure out where 
I do want to affect change. It's what the memorial has allowed me actually and very interesting is to slow down and to think, so is, so is my kind of anti-racist work? Is it in the classroom? Is it building syllabi that look differently? Is it, and yes, that's one of the answers. I would say I've been doing that for three years, but it, it will be even more prominent, I think, in the work that I do. Um, it's insisting, it's pushing back actually against uh, predominantly white voices that want to take charge of certain kinds of narratives and saying, you know what, I actually do this work and I have a lot to say about public monuments and I want to be in your conversation and it can't just be white men talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in that way, it's um, settling in that we have a lot of work to do as well. I mean, this is what this project reminds me every day, that to really think about how we spend our resources, that we need to amp up dedicated resources to mental health. We need to start thinking very deeply about homelessness. All of these are tied together to this. So um, it is allowing me to sort out where what I need to do next. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for, for talking to us. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Cami now to close us out. Kaylee, thank you so much. I really appreciate yes. the, the opportunity to, to talk with you today. Thank you. And thank you to both of you. I mean, this has been nothing short of amazing. Kaylee, thank you for facilitating. Dr. Ader, thank you so much for just coming um, and talking about your research and talking through your research, right? Mm -hmm. You know, as an academic, as someone that's grieving. Um, and if I could just comment, I'm sure everyone that's watching out there, please get your questions in, your comments. We want to just keep this discussion um, going. And I love that. Is it 120 days? No, it's going to just keep going when it needs to go. Sure. I just want to leave you with these. And you just kind of summed it up. But as we go forward into this new kind of future with um, digital mourning, it's so interesting that when you look at it with the critical race lens, it's a disruption to this white narrative. There's a lot of conversation amongst deaf scholars now, you know, we're at the Zoom funeral, we have this new mm -hmm. kind of digital avatars. Um, and what you're saying is it's still a way to resist, right? Whether it's with the, the black squares and the, and the white lettering. So I just want to thank everyone. Um, Please go to our website, uh, www.radicaldeathstudies.com. If you want to see more things like this, please donate. Um, just go there under the contact link. And thank you so much. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm.